Welcome to the Workplace Wellbeing Essential Series. I'm Mari Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Advancing Wellness. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this expert interview where we explore topics that impact employee well-being. My guest today is Laurel Farr. Laurel is the founder of Distribute Con Consulting and the Remote Work Association. Laurel starts, strengths, strengthens, and leverages virtual workforces. Her thought leadership on the topic of remote work is sought after around the globe for collaboration with the world's top companies and governments to eliminate virtual worker discrimination, prevent policy retraction, increase remote job accessibility, train distributed leaders, and design economic initiatives. Additionally, she also shares her expertise as a Forbes contributor and a subject matter expert for business education curriculum and an advisor on virtual software products. Laurel, I'm so excited for our conversation today. Thank you, me too. Thank you for having me. You and I have had a number of conversations over time about remote work, and there's been much written about what you know employees today are looking for in their jobs, when flexibility has always been one of those things. And that topic comes off, the flexibility topic comes up a lot in the form of remote working. And working from home, as we sometimes refer to it, has taken on a new meaning in the last few weeks here in the spring of 2020. And it's no longer a nice benefit or a perk. Today, it's for most of us, a way of life. And most of us are working um, from home and it looks like we will be for a while. So many employers have been launched into this remote workforce without much planning or even much forethought. And I, there's no doubt that it hasn't always gone well for some employers and that, the, you know, that this approach um, isn't necessarily how employers would have wanted to undertake moving their workforce um, to a, a working from home situation. What is the impact from your perspective of this sudden change? You know, there's so many impacts, personally, professionally, economically. This is a real time of adjustment for all of us. And so I think it's very, very critical that we all stay as grounded as possible and remember that never in the history of time has the KISS principle been more relevant and more necessary, which is keep it simple, stupid, right? Like right. we really, really have to just simplify because everything is in transition. Everything is in question. Um, we're, we're not just moving from point A a to point B, you know, we're moving from point A to point B to point T, C to point D on a daily basis, and we don't even know what point Z looks like. Um, so we really just need to simplify and stay unified as a team. And that doesn't need to be overcomplicated. You know, I, I'm getting so many questions about what tools should I be using and what software should I be adopting? And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, take it way, way, way back, back from there. Just have a centralized communication channel as a team, the one that you're already using, or revert back to email if you need to. Just somewhere where you all know that you can stay in touch throughout the day and just lock that in and, and so that you can maintain unity. And as you maintain unity, that will allow you the luxury and the ability to be adaptable and be flexible as we continue to navigate uncharted territory. Mm, that's really important. So what can employers do to ensure that they're providing a good experience for their employees who are now all remote workers? I think it's really critical to communicate and I don't want to be redundant, but this really is what it boils down to is just communicate, communicate, communicate. Remember that in virtual workplaces, the name of the game is self management, which is how remote work is possible, right? That we allow these remote workers to be more autonomous than ever before, because that's what gives them schedule and, and location flexibility. Now in an ideal world, obviously we provide you training and infrastructure support and before making this transition right now we don't have that luxury so again we need to simplify and just say how do you do this at a very very basic level how do you support remote workers you empower them you trust them mm -hmm. you encourage them and you allow them to 
really control and hold and manage their own results while you as a manager play a more supportive role. How can I help you? Is there mm -hmm. anything that you need today? How are you doing today? How are you feeling? Really just nurturing them and providing what I call this, you know, incubator or Petri dish mentality, um, which is you create this, this ideal environment in which they produce their own results. And that's really what, what we need to simplify into right now is that our workers manage their results, but the managers support the workers in doing so. Well, I, it seems, it, it seems so simple, but I know that it's not. And in it, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations just in my neighborhood, <laughs> you know, I, I guess, and specifically they seem to come from young people who talk about, you know, I get the eye roll every time I, you know, I hear them talk about what's going on on their calls and their um, experiences now with the workplace, you know, moving to this virtual setting. And my sense is that culture doesn't always support that, that an organization hasn't always had the kind of culture where there's high trust and where mm -hmm. managers, you know, don't micromanage. Uh, so it seems like this might be, if anything, a difficult challenge for some managers. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. In fact, it's almost counterintuitive. If you have a management style that previously has been very sensory based, such as I can see you working and, you know, I can hear phones ringing, I can see people in the conference room, um, that but that uh, sense of proximity and accessibility is really critical to our security as managers. So yeah, when all of a sudden you take away all of that sensory supervision and you're just asked to, you know, trust it, is a terrifying gap to fill. Mm -hmm. And so it's completely, completely valid. And again, this is why we really want ideally to have a lot of um, transition and support during the change management process. Um, so yeah, right now, as we just jump into this in the deep end, then it's going to feel quite foreign and, and mm -hmm. quite, um, quite a shock at first, but this is really the key to sustainability. And again, we don't need to overcomplicate it with new workflows, new processes, right. just on a day-to-day -day basis, managers can just shift their mindset to being more supportive instead of um, more hands-on because that is, that's the counterintuitive approaches. When we have that sensory um, mentality, then it very quickly and easily translates into micromanagement or an invasion mm -hmm. of privacy. What are you doing right now? Are you working right now? What do you, have you accomplished these deliverables yet? Like it very, very, very quickly becomes very controlling, much, much more controlling than you would be in the office because you don't have this, this trust and you don't have this, any visibility in, in which to report productivity. And so you become obsessed with it as a manager and it quickly turns the, a corner into micromanagement. Yeah. And negative for sure. Yeah. In, in some of our previous conversations, we've, you've talked about this idea that really is a change of mindset. And I'd like you to comment on this a little bit more here is that work is not a physical place as much as it is a set of tools and processes. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Because I think this mindset idea is what we're really living right now. So how can we help people understand this mindset? Yeah, in fact, this actually um, reverts back to your question about culture as well, right? Is that we think, oh, how in the world are we going to translate our culture? You know, our culture is where we hang out in the break room and celebrate birthdays together. Like, there's no way that we could ever digitize that. And you think you had just really have to shift your mindset into thinking, well, what is culture? Um, where does culture come from? Um, if you're really worried about remote worker isolation or your culture not translating to a virtual environment, is your entire culture really based on proximity? Is it really based mm -hmm. on everybody being in the same room? Because I can tell you from personal experience, as well as interviewing thousands of remote workers, that it is very, very possible to be sitting next to somebody five feet away and still feel incredibly lonely and incredibly disconnected from a culture. So we really just need to shift our thought about how to develop culture and how to develop um, these rituals and workflows that facilitate culture and that strengthen culture into digital experiences and just shift them from 
the channels, right? We're not going to be doing these in person, but we're still going to be doing them human to human. And so mm -hmm. we're just going to be using different channels in which to facilitate those processes. So um, it's just shifting this, this mentality and these ideas of instead of getting together in the break room, how can we get together in the Zoom room? Um, instead of, you know, leaving them a, a gift on their desk, how can we mail a gift to them? I mean, it's very small and simple changes, but it really forces us to step back and think, what is our culture really about? And if culture is about making sure that our workforces feel valued and appreciated and individually recognized, do they really do that now? Or are we just telling ourselves that they do because we throw parties for them in the break room? Okay. So really, all, everything about remote work is really about coming into this with its intention and not just translating what has been happening in a physical office and translating that into a virtual experience, but taking a step back and using this as kind of like the spring cleaning of our entire people operations and yeah. saying, is there a better way to do yeah. this? Is there a better, I mean, just meetings, for example. Okay, we get together and we talk, but is there a more efficient way to do this? If we're all right. going to meet together in a Zoom room, maybe we send the agenda prior to, people report mm -hmm. on Slack, and then we have, we're able to have a shorter meeting for higher productivity. So yeah, everything about this transition to remote is really about taking a step back and saying, is there a better way? And that includes our culture, our management styles, and our rituals and workflows. Well, that's all fabulous. And I think that's one of the silver linings, perhaps, that we're experiencing here is yeah. people are suddenly realizing, you know, like, why are we having these meetings? And gee, they, you know, it's not as efficient as it could be. And we don't have agendas or they're learning some, you know, having some new disciplines that are, are coming from this. So it's all mm -hmm. that's great silver lining. It is. One of the elements of the well-being model that we use, or two of the elements of the well-being model that we use are based on connection and community. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in this time of crisis, those are two things that we need even more of. And I'm just curious, what suggestions do you have for employers in how to ensure that they're staying connected with their employees and creating that sense of community? What are some of those kinds of things that we can be doing? You know, at the sake of, of being redundant, I will come back to communication. It, in a virtual world, we are what we type and we are what we say. We don't have the benefit of nonverbal communication or even environmental cues or contextual cues in really to support and, you know, provide this unspoken foundation to our relationships. We have mm -hmm. to over articulate. We have to over communicate. And so it really forces us to be, to adopt this mo much more transparent and empathetic yeah. communication style that we may have felt very uncomfortable with in an office, right? I mean, we were trained very subconsciously in an office environment to sit down and shut up and get to work, right? Like this is not about um, distracting your coworkers, right? Like just get to work. And, uh, but here in a virtual business world, because we are so much more efficient in other processes and we don't have the natural distractions, we actually have to create space for human to human connection and mm -hmm. for culture building activities and things like that. So yeah, as a manager to, to really support our teams, it's just a matter of creating space for those conversations to be happening. Again, doing those daily check-ins. How are you doing? What are you struggling with? Allowing them to have space for their personal lives because right now everybody's lives are one big blur of work and life and family family and everything there's there's it is not segmented at all and so yeah creating some safety for people to ask questions or to be interrupted by a child or a dog or something um, or to take a break in the middle of the day and say hey look we're all feeling stressed and anxious if you need to take a break in the middle of the the day, go for a walk, please do it. I'm really just treating humans as humans and communicating that, not just feeling that or thinking it, but communicating that to your team and, um, you know, posting encouragement to do so and setting the example yourself as a leader and saying, hey, I was having a really bad day today. I was feeling super burned out and really, really stressed. My kids were being loud. I just thought, man, this couldn't work. So I went for a walk and I feel better. How are you guys coping with this? Just really facilitating that unification. 
Well, that's always, those are great examples. So thank you for sharing those. I think this whole idea that we're all a little vulnerable in this and yeah. being able to just be human, be more caring, more compassion, more empathy, you know, are all of the things that we're going to need right now to be able to get through this. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what we all need to remember is that we are all in this together and we're all going to get through this together, but we, we have to be together. We have to be connected with communication and with empathy. Yeah, that's great. I'm curious from your perspective of where we're sitting here right now, uh, what you would think the long-term impact is going to be um, for remote working. You know, will people realize that remote working has improved their well-being and their quality of life? You know, they don't miss that commute and they don't miss, you know, the, the harried lifestyle that they lived before. And, um, you know, they may not want to head back to the workplace way quite so quickly. So I am just curious, you know, how do you think that this is going to flow in the future? I'm so glad you phrased it this way because I've been getting the question so much of, oh, is this the new normal? And I thought... Yes. No, like this is not the new normal. Heaven forbid. I mean, heaven help us if it is the new normal. Um, but it's not. Um, and it's completely unrealistic to think, oh, okay, well, from this point forward, every single company is now going to be fully distributed. That's ridiculous as well. So it's it's a pendulum swing. We, we need to balance somewhere in the middle. And what that looks like from my perspective is that... Um, never can it go back to what it was before. You know, everybody working in offices nine to five, the majority of, of the workforce, and um, specifically the managers and leadership of, of co-located companies thinking, no, this isn't an option for us, or that wouldn't be possible for us. That was a, the primary barrier to adoption in the past. And that's irrelevant now. Now mm -hmm. that we've seen um, it's not only theoretically possible, but we've done it. We've conducted these trials and we've seen what has gone well and hasn't gone well. So we can never go back to that point. So there is never, there is no such thing as going back to what was normal because we are forever changed. Um, but then it's also not possible to go fully distributed in the entire world overnight. So where it lies somewhere in the middle is um, I see that remote work is now just work. It's just, flexibility is now and forever will be an option. It's always going to be a plan mm. B somewhere in the back of everyone's minds. And so it's going to be up to each individual leader and company to decide not, not no longer if this is possible, but how and when is this possible? How are we going to use this? How often are we going to leverage remote work? Um, in what quantity are we going to leverage remote work? And I say leverage because it really is a strategy. There's immense business savings mm -hmm. to be had here and employee retention and economic sustainability. I mean, there's really massive, massive benefits here. Um, and so that's what I think business leaders can and should be thinking from this point forward is, how, what does this look like in the future? How are we going to adopt and apply the lessons that we learned as a distributed team? Um, things like asynchronous communication and empathetic communication and things like that. Like we kind of came together as a team and we got through some hard stuff. How can we continue to apply that in our office environment? Um, what is a contingency plan going to look like in the future so that it runs more smoothly? Things mm -hmm. like that. So it will, um, it's not going to go back but it's also not going to go to the other extreme, but it is going to go somewhere in the middle of we're, we're a changed people and our workplaces have changed and we're going to start to really understand and, and leverage remote work in a new and innovative way. Mm, you're so well said, as always, Laurel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if our audience wants to learn more about you and the work that you're doing, where can they find you? Yeah, well, I'm easy to find on social media. I'm the only Laurel Farr, which I'm sure you'll link in the show notes. Um, LinkedIn and Twitter are the best places to find me. Um, you can also got, get in touch with both of my organizations for the consulting side. It's Distribute Consulting. But if you're a remote work advocate and you'd like to connect with other advocates and help spread the message about how to work remotely effectively, um, then you can join the Remote Work Association, which is just roundtable events of, of fellow advocates and leaders. Fabulous. Well, thank you again so much for being here today to discuss this important and timely topic. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.